ever have that time or that season in your life where you say, where did that come from? Or why do I keep saying that? Or, or even why do I keep doing that same thing over and over and over again? I'm glad you joined me today because that's what we're going to examine over the next several weeks. Many of the things that we do and say and the ways in which we react to the circumstances and the situations around us uh, a lot of times are much deeper than we think. Uh, many times that we think we have a behavior problem when really, in all actuality, you and I have a heart problem. <laughs> See, many times we think we have a fruit problem, but really it is a root problem. When my brother and I were teenagers, we had friends that would come over to our house and uh, we would play football in our backyard in the fall. However, my dad had planted, uh, several years before that, he had planted some chestnut trees around our backyard. And if you're familiar with chestnuts at all, when the, the chestnuts fall off the tree in the fall, they're covered with a, a, a spiny burr that if you were to step on it or fall on it, it, it is extremely painful. And so before we'd play football, we'd have to go around, pick up all those chestnuts, put them in a box, and then we would start playing. And in, inevitably, during the game, somebody would fall on a chestnut that we had missed and create pain. And we'd get together the next week, and we'd have to go through and pick up all the chestnuts again. You see, what we had there, the reason why we had chestnuts in the grass is because there were chestnut trees in the yard. What we had was not a fruit problem, what we had was a, a root problem. And the same way is true in our lives. When we uh, harm someone with uh, the barbs of our words or our actions, we spend time picking all of those things up and apologizing only to find ourselves doing the same things again, over and over and over again. And that's what we're going to examine here over the next five weeks. I've entitled this series, Inside Out, Taking Control of the Emotions that Seek to Take Control. We all have those emotions inside of us that rear up and want to take control. And really, it's based on a movie that was made in 2015 by Pixar called Inside Out. It's a little cartoon, and Riley, the main character of the movie, you, as you watch the movie, you discover that her emotions inside of her are fighting for control, and whichever emotion is in control, that emotion determines her actions, her conduct, her words, even the decisions that she makes. And none of us are immune to that. All of us have those emotions that seek to take control. And so over the next five weeks, we're going to look today at guilt and we're going to look at anger and pride and jealousy and worry and discover how you and I can take control of the emotions that take control. Because you know and I know that what we have is not a fruit problem. What we have is much deeper. It is a root problem because what is in our heart eventually will manifest itself in our behavior. What's inside will eventually manifest itself outside. I remember a few years ago, I had a glass of grape Kool-Aid and I was carrying it into our living room and uh, we had a white rug in the middle of our living room. And as I was walking into the living room, uh, our dog jumped up on my leg and bumped me and guess what came out of my glass? <laughs> grape Kool-Aid, you're right. Because what was in the glass was what came out of the glass. And the same is true of our hearts. You see, our, what comes out of us is not an exception to what's in our heart. It's actually a reflection of what is already in our hearts. When we get bumped, when we get jostled, what's in there is what manifests itself outside. And so as I said, today we are going to begin with guilt. There's a lot of people in our world who are walking around and they are controlled by their guilt. Guilt is that dread uh, of, of those things that we have done in the past, the things that we have said, the actions that we have taken, the reactions that we have had, the sins that we have committed in our lives. They, they hang over us like a dark cloud of dread. Guilt can cause us to live in pain, kind of like that person who's had an amputation and they have those phantom pains. Uh, guilt is the same way that 
that, that thing that, that looms in our past that causes us pain in our present. Guilt causes us to live in fear. We're afraid because of that guilt that's inside of us because of what we've done in the past. There's that fear that the people around us who know us, that they may discover what we have done in the past. And, and our guilt uh, controls us in those relationships. There are so many people in the world who are crippled by guilt. Psychologists have discovered that the number one cause of mental illness and, and suicide in our nation is an overwhelming feeling of guilt. There's been, there's been studies that have been done in 2013. Their uh, researchers discovered that there is a correlation, there's a connection between guilt, shame, and social anxiety. That there's people who, who feel anxious when they're around other people because they're carrying around the guilt. The guilt has taken control of them. And when they're in uh, groups of people, there is great anxiety associated with that. In 2015, they discovered there that guilt is, is strongly connected to depression. That a lot of people are experiencing depression because guilt has taken control of their heart and their mind and their life. And it affects everything in our day-to-day -day lives. When guilt takes control, it affects our day-to-day -day life. It will affect our relationships with the people around us. Guilt can impact us emotionally, relationally, spiritually. And there are some who guilt has affected them even physically. And, and really, when we experience guilt in our life, when guilt rares up and seeks to take control, oftentimes we try to deal with it in one of two ways. The first way is people will run. They'll, they'll just try to run to escape the guilt that they are feeling. There are people who will run out of a relationship because of guilt. There's people who will run out of a workplace because of guilt. There's people that I know who have run out of the church and they've just left the church because of guilt that is in control of their lives. There's another group of people that they don't run, but they rationalize their guilt. And, and what they'll say is when guilt starts to take control, they'll, they'll simply rationalize and say, oh, what I did wasn't, wasn't nearly as bad as people are saying it was. Or, or what I said is, is not as bad as my friend has said. Or my actions in that situation, uh, I mean, I, I don't do things that, that are quite as bad as my neighbor. And somebody has said that when we rationalize, what we're doing there is we're telling ourselves rational lies. And so uh, guilt can take control, and, and many times we want to deal with it in an unhealthy way. But today I want to show you from a biblical perspective how you and I can deal with guilt. Because you see, when we run and when we rationalize, it may ease our guilt temporarily, but it will not ease our guilt permanently. We may be able to control guilt for a little bit, running or rationalizing, but eventually guilt's going to come back and seek to take control again. So today I want to share with you how you can control guilt before guilt takes control. We're going to be in the book of Romans today, Romans chapter 8, and just I want to give you a very brief background. Uh, Romans chapters 1 through 3, there Paul was writing to the Romans, and basically he was just writing in those three chapters, and he said, you know what, all of us are guilty before God. All of us have blown it. All of us have missed the mark. All of us have fallen short. He, he actually writes in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that every single one of us, every man, woman, boy, and girl, that all of us have failed to live up to the standards that God has placed before us. And we're all guilty. However, Paul goes on in chapters 4 through 7, and there he talks about the grace of God. And his argument in those chapters is just simply that our grace, or God's grace, is greater than our guilt. That whatever it is that we have done, however it is that we have fallen, wherever, whatever area of our life in which we have stumbled, those things that we feel guilty about, Paul makes the argument that God's grace is greater than all of our guilt. 
And so we're going to look here in Romans chapter 8 in the first three verses of this chapter. But I want to, I want to give you kind of the take-home truth right now. And that's this, is that our past may remind us, but our past does not define us. Like those things that we have done in the past that maybe we're ashamed of or things that we shouldn't have done or things that cause guilt to start to take control, they, they will remind us, absolutely. But those things in our past do not define us. And that's the argument that Paul is going to make here in Romans chapter 8 in the first four verses of this great chapter. And so let me read it to you and we'll come back and we'll look at it. He says this, he says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Paul talks here in these four verses, the fact that our past may remind us, but our past does not define us. And he starts here with the reality. He says in chapter 8, verse 1, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He starts that verse with the word therefore. Bible people have often said, when you see a therefore, you've got to find out what the therefore is there for. And most think that he's referring back to everything that he had written to this point in Romans, where we are all guilty, but God's grace is, is, is greater than all of our guilt. And he says, therefore, because of that reason, because of God's grace in our life, therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And that word that Paul uses there for condemnation means to, to be sentenced or to be found guilty. And, and what he's saying, he says, because of God's grace, now there is no sentencing for us. We are not found guilty in light of God's grace. And actually, in the original language, when Paul wrote this in Greek, he started this sentence with the word no. And it's, it's placed at the beginning of the sentence for emphasis. He wanted people to understand that there is nothing. There is nothing that you have done in your past. There is nothing that you have said. There is no reaction that you could have had in your life that would cause God to condemn you. But then he, ha he adds the caveat here. For those who are in Christ Jesus... He says, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you have committed your life to Jesus Christ, he says, our past may not be able to be erased, but our past can be faced. <laughs> because here, he says, if you're in Christ, if you're a follower of Jesus, that there is no condemnation. And when I read this verse, I oftentimes think, about how Paul must have felt when he was writing these words. Because Paul had done some pretty bad things in his life, things that I am sure that when he thought about him, when he was reminded of his past, that these actions, this guilt tried to define him. In, in Acts chapter 8, we get kind of a little synopsis of what Paul was like. Stephen, the, the, the first martyr for Jesus Christ, had just been stoned. He, he was dead. And this is what Luke writes about Paul, who was Saul at the time. He says, and Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. I am sure there had to be nights in which Paul was lying down to go to sleep and guilt would rise up and seek to take control in his life. But here Paul reminds himself and reminds you and I, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's the reality. The, the verse here is just simply a declarative statement. 
Paul didn't say, hey, I hope one day that there's no condemnation for me. I, I really pray that I can work hard enough so that there is no condemnation for me one day. He says it is just a, a statement of fact. It is a declarative statement. He says this is the reality that you and I live in as followers of Jesus, that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. What Paul is saying here, he's saying the reality is this, is that our past may remind us, but our past does not define us. And then he goes on, he talks about the reason. I mean, why, what is the reason that there is no condemnation? He says in verse 2, because. He says, this is the reason why. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Now, in this verse, he uses the word law twice. Many times we think of that word law, we think about uh, obedience or disobedience to the law. And that, that's not the way in which he's using the word here. The word law is that he uses in this verse just simply means it's, a, it's just a reality of life. For instance, we, we use that today. We say the law of gravity. You see, the law of gravity, we cannot obey or disobey the law of gravity. The law of gravity is just simply the reality of what is true. And so here he says, he says, the reason why this reality is true, the reason why our past may remind us but does not define us is because Christ Jesus, through, the, through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. What he's saying is the reality used to be the law of sin and death, that we were all sinners, we were reminded of our past, and we were also defined by our past. Because of our sin, there was death. However, Paul says it was through Christ Jesus that the law of the spirit of life came in, and it superseded the law of sin and death, that he ushered in a new reality. For instance, uh, we would talk about the law of gravity, but the law of magnetism supersedes, it overpowers the law of gravity. If you have a big magnet, it's going to pick something up. It's going to defy the law of gravity. And here Paul says the same thing. He says our old reality was there was the law of sin and death, but this new reality of Christ brought in a law of spirit, of life, that has set us free from the old life. And that's the reason this reality is true. That's the reason our past may remind us, but our past does not define us. Paul goes on in the next verse and he talks about the route. How, how did this happen? He says in verse 3, For what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. He says now he's using that word law that we obey or disobey. And he's saying what the law was powerless to do. Just think about the whole purpose of a law. The purpose of a law is to tell us how low we can go and then condemn us when we go below. The only thing a law can do is bring condemnation. And so he says here, because of the reality that there is no condemnation, how this happened is that the law was powerless to, to the, the law could only condemn us. He says, and it was weakened by the sinful nature. But what the law couldn't do, God did by sending his son, own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. You see, that's the whole message of Easter that we just celebrated last week, that we in our sin, we deserve to be condemned. But God sent Jesus into the world to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for our sins, to be a sin offering, that he was laid in a tomb. And on the third day, he rose again to give us everlasting life. He said, God did this by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be sin offering. And as a result, he says, and so he condemned sin in sinful man. You see, you and I are not condemned because of our sin. Because Jesus came and condemned sin. That's why it's through him. That's how our past may remind us but our past does not define us. And then Paul concludes here with the result. If you look in verse 4, he says, He did this in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. 
all the requirements of the law that you and I could not live up to. He sent Jesus into the world so that the requirements of that law might be fully met in us. Because we could not do it in our own power, but through his divine power, it has fully been met. And the verb that Paul uses there is a passive verb. It's not something that we have done. It's something that has been done to us. And the bottom line here for Paul is this is that through Jesus, he has now restored us to a guiltless relationship with God. And the truth is this, in light of everything that Paul has written in these four verses, the truth is this, is that yes, you and I are guilty, but we are not condemned. What Paul would say is that our past may remind us, but our past does not define us. There's a theological term that's used to describe this, and it's called justification. And I remember the first time that that was explained to me in a way in which I could understand. And the, the pastor said this. He said, when you are justified, it, ju ju it means that now God looks at you just as if you had never sinned. And that happens the moment that you receive Christ Jesus as your Savior. What God says is, I see you, but I don't see that. I see you because of what Jesus has done for you. I see you, but I don't see what you have said. I don't see what you have done. I don't see how you have reacted. I see you, but I don't see that. You see, we are guilty but we are not condemned. Our past may remind us, but our past does not define us. And so those things are true. So what should we do? Like that is the reality of the situation. But as a result, how do we practically live that out in our lives? I want to just give you three steps that I think that if you will incorporate them into your life, when guilt starts to take control, if you incorporate these three things into your life, you'll say to guilt, you're not in control. I'm going to control you. And it's straight A's. And they all begin with A. Number one is acknowledge. In Lamentations 3.40, it says this, Let us examine and probe our ways, and let us return to the Lord. Lamentations, it tells us, he says, Let us examine, let us probe the things that we have done. So the first step in, in controlling our guilt is just simply acknowledge the things <laughs> that have caused us to feel guilty. All of us have done those things in our life. We have said things, we have done things, we have reacted in ways that create guilt in our lives. And so what we need to do, first of all, is just sit down and acknowledge it. I would encourage you to get a piece of paper and something to write with and just simply think. When guilt starts to take control of your life, what are the things that cause you to feel guilty? And just start to write them out. And here's what you'll discover. I think it's important because I think that when things pass through our lips and through our fingertips, that it begins to provide clarity for us. We're, we're able to untangle all the confusion in our minds and our hearts when we're able to, to write them out or speak them out. And so just, just grab a piece of paper, something to write with, and just start to write out and acknowledge. Hey, you know, when I did this against my spouse... It's causing me a lot of guilt. When I reacted this way with my children, it's caused me to have guilt. When I, when I, when I uh, did that thing at work, it's now causing me to have guilt. And just, just acknowledge it in your life. The second step then is to take those things that you have acknowledged, the things that you've identified that cause you to have guilt, and then just simply admit them. In 1 John 1, 9, it says there that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John uses that word confess, and that word just simply means to agree with God about something. You know, it's just simply saying, God, you're right. What I did was wrong. Whatever it is that's caused you to have guilt, usually it's something that you have done wrong. 
Now, there are times in which we have guilt for things that we have not done wrong, but, but I'm talking about those things that, that creep up in us because of what we have done that has created guilt in our lives. And just simply admit them to God. And not only that, but I would also encourage you to admit it to someone else. Because the truth is that we are only as sick as our secrets. And I'll tell you what, in my own life, there is great freedom when I have, when I have that accountability person in my life, when I have that good friend that I can trust, and I just share with them those things in my life that I've done that has caused me, caused guilt to start to take control. And, and here's what you're going to discover as we go through these next five weeks, as we talk about these emotions that take control, that it's only when we drag those things into the light that we begin to find healing and wholeness from them. It's only when we get our guilt out into the open that we can say to guilt, you're not in control because I'm going to control you. So acknowledge, admit, and then number three is adjust. You see, it's not enough just to acknowledge what you've done. It's not enough just to admit what you've done. But now you've got to decide that I'm going to do things differently. Our past reminds us that the things that we did, we just didn't do them right. Even though we're not defined by it, but it should still remind us. That's why it says in Acts 3.19, repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. You see, a lot of Christians think they've found a loophole in, in God's grace that, you know, I'll just do what I want because I know that when I ask God to forgive me, right, he has to forgive me. So I'll just live however I want to live. I'm going to do what I want to do. And, you know, when guilt starts to creep up, then I'll just come to God. I'll ask for forgiveness. He has to forgive me. But then I'll just keep doing the same old things over and over and over again. That is what is called cheap grace. The Apostle Paul in his writings, he said, shall we sin more so the grace may continue to increase? And his response to that was, God forbid we should do something like that. Because of God's grace, it ought to compel us to live differently and adjust our lives. I can almost guarantee that there are some, some guys who are watching this and you probably need to adjust what you're looking at on your phone. There are people who are watching and you need to adjust the way in which you're talking about your coworkers. You're watching today and maybe you need to adjust the way in which you're treating your spouse. You're watching today and you need to adjust the amount of alcohol that you're uh, it, taking into your body. You're watching today and, and maybe you need to adjust your attitude towards someone else. You see, if, if we don't adjust, if we don't change the direction that we're going, what will happen is the guilt will just continue to increase and increase and increase. And that's why it says in Acts 3.19, repent. Repentance is just understanding that I'm going the wrong way. Stop, turn around and start going the right way. Somebody has described it as a man who's walking down the street and he's going in the wrong direction. He realizes he's going in the wrong direction and he turns around and starts going back in the right direction. You see, that's true repentance. So acknowledge, admit, and adjust. And what you're going to see is, is when guilt starts to take control, you can, look, you can say to guilt, you are not in control. And so because of all of this, there's, I think there's a couple really practical implications for you and I in just our day-to-day -day lives as we seek to overcome and control guilt before guilt takes control. Number one is that because you're not condemned by God, you cannot condemn yourself. You see, you did what you did, but you are not what you did. Your past may remind you, but your past does not define you. Because if God does not condemn you, how can you condemn you? 
And so when guilt starts to reach for the control panel of your life, you can say to guilt, guilt, you are not in control because I have a heavenly father who is in control of me. And you'll discover that you'll start to take control of guilt before guilt takes control. The second implication is that we cannot be judgmental. You see, uh, a lot of people that I know who, who are judgmental, what they're doing is they're projecting their guilt on other people. And you see, when we realize, when we understand everything that God has done for us through Christ Jesus, how can we be judgmental of the people around us? And that is one of the signs when you know that guilt is starting to take control is not only when you begin to condemn yourself, is also when you become judgmental of the people around you. Your past may remind you, but your past does not have to define you. I remember when our daughter Hope was about two years old, uh, my wife Beth and myself and Hope, we visited uh, the campus of Duke University and the sun had set and we were walking around campus and it was the very first time that Hope realized and recognized that she had a shadow. And I remember her walking along kind of the square there on campus and she looked over her shoulder and she saw her shadow and recognized it for the first time and she just froze, she stopped. And then she tried to run away and she ran to me and wanted me to pick her up because she was, she was afraid of that shadow. And as I think about that story, I think about how so many people live in guilt in the same way. That they are haunted by the things that they've done in their past. And, and that guilt looms over them like a giant shadow that they cannot ever escape. And when that happens, guilt starts to take control. And we begin to do things and act out in ways that reflect that we have allowed guilt to control us. And so I want you to remember, I want you to realize the reality of what Paul says here. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Your past may remind you, but your past does not define you because you have been forgiven if you are in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the ways in which it speaks to us. I pray for believers who are living in guilt. And God, I pray that you would give them uh, the truth and the power to take control of their guilt. May they know that they are not defined by what they have done in their past. And may they move, be able to move forward with you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me today. I would encourage you to tune in next week as we talk about how to control anger. And I can't wait to see you soon.